actually somebody interviewed me about, somebody from the South interviewed me in, in Vanderbilt, and they started grilling me about the commonalities between Michigan and the South, and it was a little bizarre how many there were. So we could have a whole other pan a afterwards with the wine, come talk to me. I, I think we'll talk about it, Desmond. There's something about a culture of ruin, I think, about both places that's very, but also a tenth of the South moved up here to work. That's in right, in the auto plants. Yeah. 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 Somebody told me that the original term hillbillies uh, came from Michigan. And so, I don't know, maybe there's some, somebody with a little machine that could figure this out by the end of the... <laughs> um, this, this, is, this relates pretty closely, the next question relates pretty closely to what, uh, the, what the Jamie's take on the question about writing about the people. Um, both of your books... Um, establish their cast of characters as members of, I call them tribes, I always talk about the tribe of people, which is people you're close to, people you understand, people who are in your family. Um, but these groups of people who are not mainstream Americans, people who, who live under the radar of most mainstream Americans. And I was interested in what these books give us about these groups of people. And mainly they're giving the, the reading public they're giving this gift of the knowledge of these people who are mostly middle class and upper middle class and mostly white readers. Um, and I, I once heard somebody say, and I think it might have been V.S. Paul, and you know, he's not on, for us gals, he's not on our list of favorite people this year. Okay? Um, you can talk, I'll talk to you about that afterwards too. Um, but he said that every group of people look foolish until somebody writes about them. And I think there, there's a way, and maybe foolish isn't even the right word, but many groups of people are dismissed until someone writes about them with love, maybe. I mean, that's corny to say, but maybe it's with love or, or thoughtfully. So, um, and I noticed also that all three of us have chosen to write about poor people. <laughs> And, or in any case, people who don't know where their next can of beans is coming from. And I wonder if you have any insights as to why we are choosing to write about these people. And maybe something else. I mean, I, I think that what you're saying is true. I've never heard that quote before. Um, but I think that, you know, that, that what you're saying about the fact that you know, maybe people have to be written about with love or, or with thoughtfulness, and that's what makes them, you know, not foolish, or at least elevates them to the point of being considered, you know, as as, as human as everyone else, with the problems as being as like universal um, as everyone else's. That that's what bothered me the most, um, I guess, about um, about Hurricane Katrina and about what I heard after Hurricane Katrina, or one of the things that bothered me the most, um, because I just felt like, you know, I, I um, and I did manage some people in Michigan. <laughs> this, these were people, you know, from other places like LA, and actually from Atlanta, weirdly enough. Um, but people just had very negative ideas and very negative notions about the people who did evacuate from the storm. And they couldn't, at first they couldn't understand why they didn't evacuate. Um, and, and they just, they basically thought they were foolish, right? Um, and then and then they couldn't understand why they came back um, or why they would want to to go back and rebuild, especially considering, you know, with the way that the weather has been changing, global warming, right? This hurricanes are only supposed to get worse and become more frequent. Um, and, and, and bad news are supposed to, hit, supposed to hit more frequently. So people, I, I heard that from people, you know, who, who, who couldn't, you know, who couldn't understand any of that about, about, you know, about my people. And that's, and that's what really bothered me because, you know, people would talk to me about people that stayed or people that came back to rebuild in like abstract terms. But for me, like, that's my family, you know, that those are my cousins. Those are, you know, like these are, the, are people that I've known since I, you know, was in elementary school. Um, because I'm very much a part of a community, you know, where, where, where I'm from. And so, and so I wanted to write against that. Like, it really bothered me that, that people couldn't, that people just didn't understand, you know, um, and, and, and just thought we were dumb. Um, so, so, so that's part of the reason why I wanted to write about this family who does, you know, stay 
the faces from came and afterwards. I mean, you know, I didn't follow them all, you know, for years after the storm, but it's understood that, that they stay, they remain, and they, they rebuild. Um, so, so yeah, I, just, I, I didn't, I don't know, I, just, I didn't like what I, what I heard about us. I wanted to tell our story so that when people heard it, they would understand, you know, that even though, yes, our story is very specific and our, and our problem and our tragedy was very specific, but our experience is a human one and universal one. Um, just quickly, I want to say, if you've really been poor, even for a short while, I mean really poor, to the point where um, you know you could get arrested because you haven't been able to afford to get car insurance, uh, it makes a deep impression, even if it's no matter where you came from. That's one thing. Um, I think, uh, you know, I know the work of all of us, and I want to observe that I think uh, in our different ways, we're all very poetic writers about what's going on in the interior of, um, of people who spend a lot of time thinking, uh, introspectively, that is, or kind of solitaries in a way, um, um, and who also just happen to be living that life. I, uh, we must all feel compelled in some way to um, make more lyrical and even beautiful in a way the inner lives of people who um, who um, haven't had the good fortune to be well provided for in the society that was very that I know that has been my problem <coughs> in everything that I've written one way or another um, I you know I um, I um, I felt that um, I had the effrontery to feel that I could understand uh, a groom like Medicine Ed, uh, but I really thought that his inner life would be would be fascinating, and also that he um, would be capable of perceiving uh, the life around him as beautiful in some respects, um, and, or um, uh, susceptible of being tenderly described even when it was ugly. Somehow, uh, um, I just uh, wanted to give characters like him, and all of my characters, especially in Lord of Misrule, but probably in everything I write, are kind of outsider types one way or another. Um, I give them credit for having interesting inner lives. And um, I want to use my, um, my imagination, my lyrical imagination, to make that, to impart that to, to readers. And, um, you know, it seems to have worked. I mean, some people, um, I think, find uh, Lord Misrule, like all my books, um, uh, linguistically complicated. Um, after all, it's supposed to be a racetrack novel, and it's not like Dick Francis at all. You know? <laughs> <laughs> to a lot of people who have uttered their thoughts on Amazon, I hate to say. <laughs> Sometimes when I feel like making myself good at but, but But that was still, that was my project, and I really think that's what we're all, all three of us very much have tried to do. I'm glad we're here together. I am really glad. Um, so maybe I could ask a question about language uh, in these novels. Um, I know that, uh, Jamie, you have said that voice is your first love, some interview or other. And I, I sort of think of you as collecting pieces of language the way that crows you know, collect the shiny objects to bring back to their nests and to incorporate somehow. Um, figuring out what to do with them, saving them for years or decades. Um, and both of you apply kind of non-standard English in your, in your works, and you do it not just in dialogue. I tend to be cautious, and I do it mostly, I stick to standard English in, in, in the text, except otherwise except for the dialogue. Um, and I wonder how you, how, how you make decisions about when and how to work with 
with a language that's different from saying standard English. And I wonder in, specifically what fun there is in it, what fun in discovering language, and if you want to share any particular experience. Um, well, um, it doesn't have to be slang. You know, I, I, uh, I find slang fascinating, um, and I always have. Uh, particular slang of any profession. Uh, um, and it doesn't have to be uh, slang that's associated with uh, uh, a ghetto of any kind. Um, it can be student slang of a college. It can be, I mean, I just find uh, those varieties endlessly fascinating. And I also find, now that uh, you know, I'm a bad um, speaker of German, but, I, but um, uh, my husband who's here tonight speaks a, a dialect. His whole family, when they want to keep secrets from me, speak this very heavy Swabian dialect, which I finally began to be able to penetrate. But there too, I want, you know, uh, uh, for some reason it really, it deeply interests me. Uh, all the ways that, um, that, a, that standard language can be twisted and inflected and so forth. But it was a big problem with this book. Um, I decided to write a social novel, and I also decided to, in some ways, write a, a kind of classic novel in um, indirect free discourse, that is, third person, interior point of view, from uh, the points of view of four different characters in particular. One, that loan shark, two tie, with Medicine Ed, uh, the groom, Maggie, that lost college girl, and her crazy boyfriend, Tommy Hansel. Um, and uh, um, it was just kind of instinctive for me to decide to inflect the third person with the way they would actually speak. Um, it was the most problematic maybe with Medicine Ed. But that was also um, the material that I, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, that, that, um, that groom from South Carolina he was the most important character to me to write in some ways. So I could hardly have his thoughts be cast in the King's English. It just made no sense. Uh, but um, I published a story in Witness, then a mag uh, Michigan magazine. Um, and uh, Peter Stein, the editor, wrote back to me saying, this is a curious mixture of Euro language and uh, Medicine Ed's kind of slang. So he wasn't exactly getting what I was trying to do there. Um, and, he, and he wanted me to um, purify the exposition into something more perfectly like my language and uh, leave the, uh, the slang inflected um, um, English for inside the quotations. Um, so I was worried about it, and I sent the I sent that um, chapter, which had been dis which was disguised as a short story, to my friend Reginald McKnight, who wrote back to me um, that uh, that John Edgar Wideman had already written about this. That you know it made no sense really to uh, write in the from the point of view of a, an African American character and have all the thoughts being perfectly ordered. Um, high school English, you know, um, without any grammatical, um, I, and, and that was what I, that, that had been what I intuitively felt in the first place. But I did it for all the characters, not only for Medicine Ed. Um, Two Ties speaks in a kind of a um, Jewish, a very Yiddishized um, gangsterese uh, with a Baltimore <laughs> twist. And um, Tommy Hansel is just, although he had, he, his um, his English is is eloquent. Is also is very creepy. Like a little bit of the. I mean, he he has all kinds of ideas about his Jewish girlfriend, which sound uh, borrowed from the Protocols of Zion. I mean, it's really kind of scary. But um, so they each have have a. Um, they each um, cause their that that third person reportage of their thoughts to be very different one from the other. Um, and that was, that's probably the most, um, most unconventional decision I made with this novel. Um, and I'm lucky that it worked it as well as it worked, I'd say. Nothing radical at all, aren't you? <laughs> Not at all. Um, I, you know, for me, it was, I guess, 
what most interested me about voice in, in the novel that I wrote um, is that first, first of all, is that, I mean, I, I haven't written many books. Um, you know, this is only, Salvation Home is only my second novel. And my per first novel was, was uh, you know, the, the narration was, you know, third, third, was all third person, um, close third person, close third person. But then this was, you know, the first book that I'd written, um, first longer project that I'd written, that was from, written from a first person perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and I didn't know if I was comfortable with that. I don't know why when I began writing um, that I thought that, you know, third person was a way to go for me. Um, maybe I was afraid of, I, I think that I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to express, or that the characters wouldn't be able to express what I wanted them to express. Um, because the first person found me in some in some ways, right? But then when I was writing the book, I realized, I read a quote that I feel like that Faulkner said, of course, that I can't remember now, but it had something to do with like the rich inner lives of his characters and how that wasn't necessarily reflected in the way they spoke to each other, but it was reflected in the like, first person narration, you know, like in, in their inner, inner thoughts that he, that, that I was there on the page. And so, and so once I, I discovered that quote and read that quote, and then, and then, you know, in my writing, Salvage the Bones, um, I figured that out that that, 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 that was work, that worked for me, you know, to, like, to, to, uh, to have my characters speak in, in, in one way to each other that, that does closely resemble um, the way that, you know, the people I know speak at home, right? Um, which you know, which is like fraught with these like unspoken intentions, and, and, and is can be limited in some ways, and that is also marked by the fact that they're not that well educated. Um, but then at the same time, with their interior life, which is reflected in the, by the narration, is very rich and, and, and very um, like very well developed and, and, and smart, um, and, and they know things, but you know, but they don't have to say. Like they don't have to explain why they know them or they feel things. They don't have to explain why they feel them. Um, and so they're allowed this like this rich inner life that 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 I think for some for some early readers was at odds with with, with their preconceived notions of who these people were. Um, but but I just you know and I and I received some feedback you know about that. But I just I mean I I, I can't that that was that wasn't something that I could budge on. Um, that was the way that I had to write, you know, those characters. <laughs> Just one more, right? I've got so many questions for you guys. It's interesting, I won't ask the Faulkner question, but the interesting thing is that in reading, in, in reading Salvage the Bones, I was very much reminded of um, As I Lay Dying, which is a series of first person narrators in a family that's filled with people of complex relationships. It, that, so, and, 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 and uh, when I was reading The Sound and the Fury recently twice, because you've got to keep reading it over and over again to get it, I was reminded, I kept thinking of Jamie, and I, I, I kept thinking of Lord Miss Rule in certain portions of that book, not only in the complexity of those relationships, but in the twistiness of the language and the, the use of dialect. So well, that's my way of slipping this question in that I'm not going to ask you guys. So uh, it, the question would have been, like, how much do you like Faulkner? But I'm not asking. <laughs> Uh, my final question will be about um, animals in the in the stories. Um, Jasmine, in your stories, first pages, we have a pit bull, China, uh, giving birth, and we stick with her and her unfortunately disappearing pups throughout the book. Um, China is vulnerable and dangerous and beloved and loving and feared. And she is responsible for a good amount of tension from page to page. Uh, in the same way in Jamie's story, um, each of the horses, um, her, the structure of the story is that the, each of the four main sections is named after a horse and race, um, a horse and a race. And um, in, um, okay, in both these novels, the human-animal relationships are rich and complicated. In both stories, we have the watching of animals, we have the handling of animals, the use and misuse, and the ill-advised administration of inappropriate medicine gotten by questionable means. <laughs> if you've read the story, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
And then we have the very people who love these animals, putting them in danger um, in the races and in the dog fights. Read it, um, which I was so afraid to read, and it was okay. It was okay to read it. Uh, in both stories, some of the most sensual scenes um, are Maggie massaging the horses and um, Skeeta handling China. And so I'd love to hear what you both have to say about using animals or the way that you chose these animals in your stories. Um. So, so with my first group of readers, you know, the, the Red Salvage, the first draft of Salvage the Bones, um, one piece of feedback that I received early on uh, was um, people said, you know, I hate people that, you know, that fight animals like this or that fight dogs like this. And yet I read these scenes and I find myself rooting for, you know, like for China and for Skeeta. And so, you know, when I was writing the first draft, um, getting feedback on it, I already knew that that was gonna, that Skeeta and his relationship with China was going to, um, you know, could affect readers um, in certain ways. It's funny because since then, I mean, but they kept reading. I've actually met people who, who had to stop, who had, they said they had to stop reading the book um, because they couldn't handle, like they, could, they couldn't handle the dog fights. Um, and, uh, and, and the violence, you know, that is, that is associated um, with that and the cruelty to animals. I, I didn't set out to, you know, to to titillate people when I this when I, when when I found out that you know that not only would trying to be in the book, but she would give birth to that litter and she and later she would fight. Um, and, and I use the word found that the words found out because. That, hap that happened organically for me while I was writing. Um, it just seemed something like something that the story demanded. Um, and then, you know, I, a after I finished the book, I began. It was a lot, a lot. I feel like a lot of the choices that I made were were intuitive. And so it wasn't until after I finished the book and I began thinking about Skeeter's relationship to China um, that I, that I wondered like. I, 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 be, I began to ask myself questions about him and his relationship with her, and, and why did he fight her, and what was it that motivated him to train her, um, you know, to, to train her to fight, because he does. Um, and I think that, this is gonna sound crazy, but I think that, that for him, and for her in some ways, that, that their, their relationship is all, about, is all about love. Like, I really think, that Skeeta thinks that he that he is helping China to be her like optimal self um, because he when he sees her he sees that she is devoted that she is loyal that she is fierce that she's a fighter um, and and he, and he he sees these things about her you know um, and 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 she is she's she's all of those things for him so I really think that that he feels like he's that he's helping her live up to her, you know, to her full potential. And I guess it's a testament to how, to how I understand him seeing her. Like he, I, I think that for Skeeta, she's not a dog. Um, she's a person, you know? And I think that, and I hope, I mean, I feel like some of the readers that, that I've spoken to about the book, that they feel that way. You know, they say, oh, my favorite character was China. And I hope that that's the case, because for me, she's not, you know, she's not, she's not just a dog. Like she's, she's a character. You know, when I talk about, you know, sitting down and, 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 and starting the book, like, I always talk about the three characters that I had in mind. She's one of those characters. Um, so I knew, I knew she was going to be important to the book, you know, from, from the very beginning. I just didn't know, you know, exactly how that was, how that was going to unfold. Um, but yeah, that's, you know. <laughs> um, I wish that all three of us would answer this question because this is really something that has interested me that women write about animals in a different way from men. From mo yeah, and not that men can't write well about animals, but uh, it's women who are really yeah, write your women will break your heart <laughs> about animals. I, I, um, why? Uh, I I really uh, I've been trying to figure that out um, and talking to various writers about it for a long time. 
You know, um, the very first place that I did a residency after I won the National Book Award was Savannah, where a writer named George Dawes Green, who writes kind of genre, dark, he's a satanic, <laughs> handsome satanic guy. So of course I was immediately attracted to him. And, uh, and uh, um, he listened to this, uh, this talk that I gave, in which somebody um, very justly said, well, what about the horrible way that race horses are treated at the end of their career? And I kind of known this would be coming. So I limply, lamely started to say, um, uh, to express my, my um, opinions about how race horses should be better treated. And afterwards, George Green came up to me and he said, you better own this. You know, you wrote a book about the racetrack in which uh, everybody gets off on the fact that these horses are asked to do something more than is good for them. I mean, you know, horse racing is nothing if not an extreme sport. Um, and, and horses have not only been trained, they've actually been bred to want to do something that more than is good for their health. Um, and that's what I love about horse racing. I have to admit it. I mean, uh, the, my, my book is full of um, images of twinship. And like you, I had to try to understand my book after I wrote it. Like, why did I write, uh, why do I write so many, um, so many images of twinning? And I think it was because I had perfect double uh, contrary feelings about this. I mean, I had a bad conscience about how much I love to see horses overextend themselves to the point of dying sometimes. Not that I wanted them to die, but they do. They do. And, uh, um, and I mean, it's, in your book, it's heartbreaking when the puppies disappear. We have to, in some way, be willing to go there. Um, well, um, and Bonnie, too. Bonnie, I think you should uh, make some <laughs> comments about this because you do the same thing. I've had that essay about the leaving the donkey, the children leaving the donkey um, tied when they go to the ice cream shop and then the donkeys disappear. You know, it's that, a one day old donkey. Oh, God. <laughs> Have you ever read? Do you want to make a comment about it? Yeah, no, I'll just finish up. I just think it's interesting, and I, I, in thinking about this in your works and in my own, that in a way of working with animals in the story, often we're showing a way of loving and both loving and destroying at the same time. That's kind of twin there, and um, I I do think there's a little bit of um, dis disingenuity. Am I got the am I got the word right? <laughs> Disingenuousness. When people can't bear, you know, to see an animal harmed in a work of fiction, when really horrible things are done to our fellow human beings <laughs> and it's somehow somehow they can't bear it when it's said to the dog. I, I can't think, quite figure that out. <laughs> but uh, I just want to say thank you very much. I wish that I could talk to you.